the show today, Dane Thomas. So this is someone I've been in contact with for quite a while. Normally in Australia, today in Germany. Hard to pin down to describe what you do, Dane. Esoteric entrepreneur. What, what the fuck? What, what do you do? It's, you know, it's the best catch-all. Like, I, I have a few things. I think of myself largely as a writer and an artist, but I've my journey has been through spirituality, tantra, embodiment, personal development, all that kind of stuff for the last nearly 20 years. Um, I mentor people particularly in spiritual businesses and spiritual modalities and stuff like that. Um, but really for me, it's kind of all about synthesizing the inner and the outer. So taking spiritual stuff and making it practical. Um, and for me, I guess magic and tantra are the kind of more left hand intangible stuff. And then business leadership purpose is more like the right hand, easier to define stuff. And those are the two big threads that I've been interested in for a long time and weave together in different ways. Great. Please talk about. He's certainly an interesting bloke. I've just consistently thought that for, for years, you know, <laughs> saying original stuff. And I'm like, okay, this guy's are different. Let's hear a bit about the origin story then. How did you get interested in, in these areas? Um, how's it all start? Born in the UK, moved to Australia in about age eight, nine. Don't really fit in. I'm a bit of a bookworm and a nerd and very fucking imaginative and mystical and dreamy and whatnot in a kind of rugby culture doesn't really doesn't really gel i remember being into things like runes and stuff when i was like 12 you know like making little runes and out of wood and um picking up odd odd books even then and you know probably in my teens shit hit the fan and i went through a kind of um juvenile delinquency sort of phase I got kicked out of a bunch of schools and charged with a bunch of illegal things and that really put me on a different path where you know the normal wife job degree whatever the things a a normal kid wants I kind of got that kind of got taken off my horizon and I went a lot deeper into things like Buddhism and shamanism and psychedelics and I don't know, various stuff. So it's it's been coming in and out since I was quite young. And my mum went down a hardcore woo-woo path in her, I guess she would have been in her late 40s when I was in my teens. So there was a kind of parallel of like, my mum's going down the new age route and I'm kind of going down the same thing. Yeah. So there was sort of, you know, something. Know, it wasn't discouraged. It was, in, uh, it was encouraged, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah I've been there. And what are some of the sort of main practices you've been trained in, things that you kind of delved into? I think Buddhism was a very big early influence. So I started meditating in my 20s and I've gone through a few different styles over the years, but a, a meditation practice has always been pretty solid. In the last eight to 10 years, a lot more like non-linear movement and, and use of movement and breath as my kind of daily practice in from from pulled from various different ways, but that's been become a big part. And then more recently, probably the last, I'd say three or four years, working with more esoteric practices like uh, the middle pillar practice from the Golden Dawn and, and a few other sort of more ceremonial magic sort of practices. Yeah, like so the Golden is- Dawn was a, a magical order that came out of Britain in the 1800s. Alistair Crowley went through it. And so they repackaged a bunch of stuff that was from Kabbalah and from Egyptian mysticism and from stuff like that. And a lot of modern day occultists would use those practices now. So the middle pillar, I do a kind of Qigongi version, but it's sort of an invocation down the central channel of the body. Um, You can do it a few different ways, but basically you're, calling a soul into the body or aligning yourself with your purpose or aligning yourself with the cosmos, if you like. But the style of which I do is it kind of looks like Qigong with talking basically, but it's the intention is to bring all parts of the self online. So it's not just, it's like a physical wake up, but it's also like an energetic body wake up. It's a psychic body wake up. It's a connection to higher self kind of thing. So I muck around with a lot of stuff like that as well. 
Yeah, let's talk about this word magic then. Um, so yeah. it's probably going to be the thing of all the things we've talked about so far, like Buddhism or Qigong, that's going to be least familiar to most of our listeners. And you, you've Very actually sure. got it tattooed on your face for those that are watching, like, listening to the podcast and not on the YouTube version. Um, so it's obviously pretty yeah. cool to, to some of the things you're about. I've seen a bunch of posts and things of you talking about it. So, um, you know, most people hear magic, they think sort of Harry Potter or something like that, you know. So totally what, yeah. what, what is it to you magic to me is there's a couple of ways to it one is basically the art and science of making things happen you know directing your will to make things happen and the kind of deeper layer is more about alignment to the cosmos or alignment from the small like the individual to the to the one so to the universal god or whatever you want to call it and my choice of that word particularly comes after like 20 years of eastern philosophy and practices and various other bits and pieces um and kind of realizing like all this stuff is awesome but it's not really built for me you know and particularly um in the new age i think people are just kind of well, they don't really understand where the bits and pieces they're working with have come from and for me you know, I sort of realized that there is an esoteric tradition that is more aligned to my genetics and culture, if you like, that, you know, as a English born Aussie, that is somewhat deconditioned and somewhat international, but still that I'm an Anglo yeah. white dude. Um, I have actually more access to the Western esoteric tradition than I have to like becoming a Zen master or whatever, even though I can might practice every day for sort of 10 years there's something about finding practices that that fit your hype, you know, and, and especially when I see like, like look, for example, in America, you know, every everyone's kind of borrowing off Native American stuff. And it's like, yeah, is that really, without getting into the whole cultural appropriation thread, which I'm not that obsessed with, but just in terms of practicality, like how much do these practices fit you and your... Yeah your culture and your typology. And for me, after a lot of work, it was like, oh, fuck. Like, I was into magic, spelt like this with a letter K since with I was really right. right. Yeah, it's the spelling with the K. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, kind of got yeah, a different yeah, yeah. flavor or something. What, what's, tell me about that spelling difference. That spelling difference sort of denotes ritual magic and what I would call the Western esoteric tradition mm -hmm. more so than Harry Potter or, you know, stage magic, like, oh, I'm going to cut a lady in half, like that kind of thing. Okay. So it, Alistair Crowley brought that spelling back way back to kind of differentiate magic from, you know, top hats and uh -huh. smoke and mirrors and stuff. Got it. And so this idea of sort of resonating a bit deeper, I think Jung said that, didn't he? Like, you know, sort of said, hey, don't bother doing yoga because it's, uh, it's not really going to gonna resonate with you. Like, like um, yeah. you know, I know some people might find that bit quite upset by that idea. And then there's, there's also the appeal of the exotic, isn't there? The kind of um, 100%. Native American or the Asian Tibetan teacher, you know, there's a sort of exoticism in that. And there's a, a dressing. 100%. I think I first remember seeing this when I went to a yoga studio in Moscow and there was all these Russians sat around in Indian clothes playing sitars, eating curries. Vegetarian. Right. It just seems so different than the Russian culture that I knew. And I thought, well, that's no sillier than British people doing it. You know, it's just because something about no. that they were Russian, it kind of jumped out at me, you know. It looks um, funnier because you're you're used to it in the other context. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is a, this is a sort of artificiality potentially here that could certainly get in the way. And then I also go, yeah, but some like meditation, isn't that pretty universal? You know, we just think something with our mind. What has my ethnic background got to do with that? I think yes, and I think what happens is whenever you step into a practice or collection of practices or anything really, but let's talk about this stuff, you step into any of this stuff, there's a bunch of embedded assumptions in it that you may or may not even understand. You know, So I studied mm -hmm. Buddhism at university for a couple of years, and I was probably three years deep before I really got like, hang on, there's no, there's no God in this. Mm. In fact, there's, there's no fucking nothing in this. And it was just like, it, it, and it took me that long to penetrate deep enough to realize 
I'd been reading this with it still with a kind of Christian filter, even though I wasn't even raised Christian, but I, you know, default of Western society that like there's all these karmic threads and all this stuff. And, but somehow I was projecting, yeah, but there's good or bad. Right. And there's, um, you know, somebody, surely someone is handing out this karma. It's not, and it's like, and I was, was getting into heavier text and it was like, no, 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 no. This is all a function of the unfolding of, the great fucking nothing. And it's like, that is so alien to where I grew up that I missed it for three fucking years of study. And it's the same as like, I have friends that one, one Israeli friend that went was super deep into kind of neo tantra, right. But does it all in this incredibly dogmatic Israeli fucking way. And it's like, that's super, um, you're super missing the energy of this thing. Yeah, but you, yeah. you basically wherever you go, there you are, right? You're going to bring think, your cultural assumptions, even if you're not. You're going to bring your culture. You're going to bring a view of good and evil it. or something like that. That's it. That's it. And also for me, you know, outside of the cultural baggage was, you know, I've been working with particularly Buddhist and tantric practices for a while, and I still do. But I got to this place. I had a friend die a couple of years ago, and it just got me to run through with kind of a bit more of a ruthless lens, okay, how much shit do I believe that I do not know is actually true? You know, how much bits and pieces have I picked up from new age, Eastern philosophy, law of attraction, you know, just all the stuff that floats around in the new age space. And it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm allowing a lot of assumptions in here that actually, I don't know if that's fucking true. Actually, I have no, you know, and I think, that's what happens when people sort of mix, mix and match traditions is you know, I sort of think of it like software, you know, and you, we're just, we're just loading all these different apps into the, into the system. And it's like, we don't even really understand, you know, it's, it's quite normal to go into a tantra workshop one week and then go drink ayahuasca the next week and, and try to like and synthesize those things together when the assumptions, the worldviews and the points of those practices it's, they've got nothing to do with each other, you know? So yeah, for get me, pretty confused at this point. Right? It's very like, confused, very confused. You're yeah. in Brighton, you're in Berlin today, and there are these, you know, certainly this is true in, you know, the Thailands, the Bali's, the meeting places where all these practices are just colliding for the first time. Yeah. And very little way to make sense of them. I guess the integral guys try and have some sort of overarching map, but... It's very little yeah. way to sort of synthesize to make sense of them. Plus, people, you know, it's, it's like <laughs> me and my wife, she's Ukrainian. I'm Anglo Irish. Crowley's my mother's maiden name, by the way. And uh, we go to the Brighton Buddhist Center and do, you know, Tibetan meditation, you know, and it, it's, it's kind of, like there's these weird combinations happening. And I don't know if that means we're in the, the best possible time or just an absolutely confused shit show. Yeah. I mean, you could say that about the internet and access to information in general. And I think it is, it is awesome. Like it's fucking incredibly rich and awesome. And I don't think that many people are equipped with an integral viewpoint or, or the ability to sort of, spit at the center of it all and go cool what am i fucking doing why am i even doing how does this fit into like what what's my place in the cosmos what's my place as a regular human being what am i trying to achieve in my life and then what practices would support that you know which is kind of how i tend to operate nowadays but i people just having a taste of this and a taste of that there's nothing wrong with it but you can do 20 years and then if you honestly assess have has anything really evolved a lot of the time, I think it's no. I think it's just that was your subculture, like you, like the the Russian the Russian yogis eat curry. That, that that's fine. It's just like being a goth kid or a hip hop kid or being into rock climbing or something. <laughs> right, you're in a club. Is it's it, like, it's, you're in a club. It's, it's, out a club. it's a nice club. It's not. It's the worst club. Humans need that. The, the you know, yoga hippie club. You know, and like okay, yeah. so you did started. I think jiu jitsu, Brazilian jiu jitsu. Uh, was it like a couple of years back, if I remember rightly? I have a I have a long term love hate relationship with jiu jitsu. So I've been doing it on and off for about maybe ten years, but it's really okay. long. It's a year or two here, a break here, a year there. So let's use yeah. that as an example. Like, how do you decide to do that or not to do that? Like, because you're someone that's pretty worldly. You've got access to all these different things, tried many different possibilities. Like, what makes you go right? I'm going to do the jiu jitsu now. 
initial relationship to jujitsu was I was doing men's work. I was doing like David Data kind of polarity work. And I had a, had a female coach doing kind of polarity coaching mm-hmm. probably, probably 10, 10, 11 years ago. And she was like, what, where are your edges? What are you scared of? And I'm like, you know, I can kind of fight a little bit. I can sort of strike. I feel like I'm all right, but I really don't like, I don't like the idea of people getting up in my space. You know, I don't like, uh, that would be the worst. And she's like, is there anything you could do to practice that? I'm like, well, there's this thing called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which I've been a little bit attracted to, but I really don't want to do. And she was like, I think you should go and do like three classes. And I was like, fuck it. So, you know, the next night I'm there on the mats with some fat guy on top of me with my legs wrapped around him. And it's like hideous. And something was sparked around like, well, if I could get competent at this, I don't have to even get good, but if I could get okay at this, it would change my character. It would force me to Mm. unpack some resilience that I don't have because this is probably, the you know, this is the worst thing I can fucking imagine right now. Not and I remember getting to a stage. <laughs> it's not pleasant, if you, especially when you don't know any You're a beginner, you're you just want to get yeah. over well, yeah. tricked yeah. up with everyone. It's just, yeah, it's yeah. overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember being about six, maybe six to nine months in and rolling with a, a fit athletic boxer who was on his, like, second class. And I was just destroyed. He couldn't He couldn't even stay on his knee. He was just falling yeah. over and just I could sweep him, get on top, choke him. And I was like, this is fucking amazing. Like, if we were in a bar... This guy would kick my ass so quickly, but just through virtue of six to nine months of very casual, you know, a couple of times a week type of training, this person is in a world that I now understand better than him. And, and as a result, I'm just all over him. And it was like, that's fucking cool. You know, that, that part I, it was a hard earned, you know, I've gone from a zero to a point two out of 10, you know, but I'm, but nice I'm like, you're at zero. Yeah. Uh, that guy's all over you, you know? So for me, JITS is like uh, something I'm a bit crap at, a bit slow at, but it's been satisfying to make hard one improvements in that. And I think as I've got deeper with embodiment and nervous system, it's now less about trying to be a killer and more about, okay, if I can regulate my breathing and my state and do like five hard five minute rounds that's a new thing you know that's that's a new level of mastery for me so i'm i'm tracking it more as an embodiment practice now than as a like it's still i think it's a great martial art for for a certain dimension of fighting but my interest to it particularly as i get older is like okay a self mastery practice and an embodiment practice no, so it seems to have got a second wave of popularity again, you know, through sort of Lex yeah. Friedman and Joe Rogan. And I know quite a few sort of geeky people doing it now and embodiment people. And, you know, I did it like 10 years ago. I did, some, I did it for a year and it was great. And um, then it was more of a kind of MMA type people doing it. It seems like it's um, yeah. evolved since then. And I, I guess I know a few Australians who do it as well. I don't know how popular it is in, in Australia compared to other places, but... The impression I got that it was relatively it's big. Yeah. It's big. Yeah, there's there's a gym everywhere. Yeah. And let's go back to magic then, because it I think quite completely there's something about it that's sort of sexy and a little bit naughty and a little bit kind of dark, right? Yeah. Like I see cool pictures yeah. of you like in a in a quarry, you know, with some goth chick covered in water or something. Like, and you know, like I was listening to um Mr. Crowley, the song in the gym the other day, you know, and it's 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 sort of a little bit naughty. But then some people yeah. go, okay, but in, that seems a bit silly to other people. It's like well, you think you're conjuring spells or something. So it's got this kind yeah. of naughty side, kind of it's viewed as somehow playing with fire, you know, the work of the devil. And then on the other side, yeah. and on the other side, it's got kind of another kind of rep. So where does it sit with all that? Because most of this is stereotypes, really. Yeah, I think those, those those stereotypes. I think for me, there is definitely something in its roots. There's this um, Clive Barker, the horror writer, has this quote that I love, and it's like, magic is the first and last religion. And I think it's a fucking dope quote because it sort of sums up before organized religion, when we're in the kind of shamanic era of humanity, for want of a better word, that's all there fucking is. You know, there is just 
painting on cave walls to manifest we're going to kill this animal tomorrow and there's you know and the shaman is chanting whatever so to make sure that the sun comes up which obviously now is not required we know it's going to come up anyway but like there's this kind of dawn of time flavor of magic and then there's this kind of i don't know as as civilization happens there's there's a lot around religion and the state are the ones that control the power you know and i think there's a lot of ideas in magic is that like fuck that i i have direct access i think that's that's what's taboo and exciting about it for me is just this philosophy of like you know i don't need the pope to get on the phone to contact god for me that's a, that's a middleman that has been inserted to actually disempower people actually i can access nature the cosmos my own power myself and i think that's the subversive sexy element and i think for me also it be- it's become an antidote to like this very light fluffy spirituality like there's this kind of light new age fluffy spirituality which is very harmless you know we've got a lot of dudes who are not in not in their balls and not in their power in the world and the split as i see it is like a lot of the people who are in their worldly power are non-spiritual you know business leaders whatever kind of leaders you know people who can do well in 3d they're not they're not typically coming from a spiritual place they're from a material place and then the people who are spiritual are like what are they good at growing beards and sitting in caves and you know chanting it's like there has been a, a pathway emphasized where the spirituality of opting out of the world is dominant even in Christianity, you know, it's still an ascension-based religion. Like, this place sucks. If you be really good, when you go to the next place, it'll be better. The same if you're a Muslim, you know? And that, that exists me, in the New Age world too, right? So it's, it's, you're going to heaven. Absolutely. It's also you're going to Bali. There's also you're going to go to the yeah. perfect yoga retreat in Sri Lanka away from the world. If, you're only, if I could only, you know, all my hippie friends like, I just want to run away and go out the woods. I mean, that's the fantasy, and I get it. Like, I do get it. But it's like definitely right. removing oneself from the world is the fantasy. But like I, I had a, you know, we hinted at this. I had an experience last week with, you know, strippers and coke and sigil magic and whatnot. That was incredibly spiritual. It was a little more grimy than the Bali. Wait, Dan, I need version. to hear about that. Strippers and coke and what? What was this? Like, you can't just throw that out. Sid, Sid, sigil magic. So I do, what I do with my goals is make into symbols and then I put them on things like you can bring them into sex. You can put them on an altar. You can, ch- I've got some shit on my phone. I don't know if it'll show up like, like that. No, it doesn't show up. Basically taking an intention, like you would set a goal, boiling it down into a symbol um, and then doing things to charge that symbol, which to look at it scientifically, I just look at it as it's a way of, dropping an idea from the conscious to the unconscious and then investing energy into that. So I went to the strip joint with a new friend on, I don't know, this time last week, early last week, and had a few drinks, got a few dances. He's not a very strip joint kind of guy. So I was giving him the like, look, I've spent a lot of time in this environment. This is kind of how, how it goes down. And then these girls are with us and they're like, what have you been doing? We're like, we've been at an esoteric conference. What the hell's that? You know, like magic. Are oh, you doing like magic and stuff? And so I pull these fucking symbols out of my pocket. Next minute I'm getting a dance and she's putting them all over her body and grinding on me. And I'm like, I think this qualifies as good sigil magic. Like the, the sigil is getting charged, you know? And it just led into a kind of a debauched evening. But for me, there was a sacred and devotional quality to it as well and on the one hand it's just some guy at the strip joint spending a ridiculous amount of money and getting loose but on the other hand i came out and after i slept it off all i want to do is like write poetry about it and fucking tune into what what happened you know it was like that was fucking amazing and it's like that's just as spiritual as going to do a yoga retreat how did your friend get on with this because I imagine there's some, I'm not he, sure about this, but I imagine there's some listeners who are kind of like, what the hell? What the fuck? Uh, he definitely grew as a person. He he had his first kind of experiences, not not that great, just, just dances and stuff. And I think he got, 
He's much more on the light spectrum in his expression. Uh-huh, so we uh-huh. were discussing Love this at light. dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, cool, let's go to strippers. He's like, oh, that's an edge for me. I'm like, that's why we should do it. Let's go. I'll induct you into my relationship to that place. And my whole thing is like, it's church. We're going to church, bro. It's church. And then there's, a, there's an idea, isn't there, a kind of Christian idea in the, the whole alternative world that it's sort of pure is better. Like, we, you know, we've got yoga and it's very clean. Yes. And white walls and everything's yes. very neat and it's sort of zen. And we don't speak and sex isn't a thing and money isn't a thing. And it's, yeah. it's sort yeah. of like we're kind of like these purer angels in this slightly inhuman but very nice world. Yeah. And it's, you know, the same people believe in all kinds of fucking stupid conspiracies, but they, they are not hip to the biggest conspiracy that is the idea that spirit and matter are separate. And that, you know, that what taking a shit is less sacred than focusing on your third eye. That's impossible. It, it all exists, you know? So it's all as sacred as each other. However, we're just so conditioned around the denser elements to perceive them as dirty you know mundane what's the word profane and i think for me that this is where the tantric viewpoint like the the actual properly tantric viewpoint and the magical viewpoint kind of come together because there's this there's this sense that the sacred and the yeah the magical is in everything if you look for it if you're prepared to look at it that way Christopher Wallace, the tantra teacher, gave us a good shit meditation when he was was on here last. You know, I said everyone talks about sex, but <laughs> shit. You know what's going on? So, well, actually, here's a toilet yeah. meditation for you. It was, and it's very polite. Yeah. Uh, it was good. All right, let's talk about money then. So, talk about the sort of the gross, the profane, the worldly, this kind of artificial split, and the things that get split off. So, for many people yeah. doing meditative practices, yoga, meditation, med- you know, ecstatic dance, whatever, they're pretty crap with money. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of marketing courses for you know, and I consider myself barely competent. I'm like you in jujitsu, you know, like I kind of know a yeah. few basics, but it seems like it's um, a huge shadow for counterculture money. Massive, yeah, and I think it's quite understandable if you look at it because the whole point, even the fact that you called it counterculture, you know, there's this thing of we set up our other little culture over here. And then we tend to practice and value the exact inverse of the mainstream culture, you know? So if, and, and if one of the criticisms of mainstream society is that money and capitalism is too, too much running the show, then we go into a little new age hangout and it's like, well, the first thing we need to do is get rid of money because that's obviously the root of all the troubles, you know? And it's like on a, on a childlike logic, that makes sense. But when you actually apply it, it doesn't make any fucking sense. And I think the one one part of how I look at this is it's another symptom symptom of an ascension based approach to spirituality. Where do we want to go? Up to the good vibes. Where is that heaven? Where everything is good and nothing is ever bad and everything is light, nothing's ever dark. And it's like it's a childish viewpoint. And so I think with that comes a lot of stuff around money, but also the people who are likely to seek um spiritual paths are people who have fallen out of love with the mainstream world or it wasn't working for them in the first place or they struggled the whole time. So with the small exception of, yeah, I made my millions early and realized it wasn't, didn't mean anything. The bulk of the people who seek that world, they weren't doing great in the, in the 3d world often. You know, uh, it's a and that was true. Right? It's like, hey, I'm crap at yeah. mainstream, so maybe there's something else I can be good at. And we all do that. Right. right? And like, I'm, I'm great in the cool. mental. I'm great yeah. in the subtle. I'm great in the touchy feely. I'm great in these realms. It's, this is true for artists as well as spiritual folks. I kind of suck at really making things happen in life. It's challenging. It's really hard for me because I'm so sensitive. And what what I am good at, like in meditation and feelings and talking about my feelings, and and so I think. We go there and we we develop those even more, and that's awesome. But at some point, you, you know, I I feel like to put this spiritual frame on it, if you incarnated on Earth in this era, you did it basically a contract that you're going to deal with money because it's one of the pr- primary elements of Earth in 
2022 and has been for a long ass time. And so I think there's a massively missed opportunity for shadow work and actual deep work in looking at what are these issues around this thing that is really only a symbol. What do you teach people then? So, you, you know, someone listens to this, they're kind of a bit of, bit of a hippie, a bit alternative. They're like, yeah, but, I, you know, I, I want to get past that. I know I need to deal with this. I want to run my business. I want to feed my kids, you know, keep doing what I love. Like, like what, do you, what do you teach yeah. them? Uh, I just did a course called Wealth Wizardry 101, which I think is out on my website or it will be shortly. But the, the premises in that were it wasn't very woo-woo. It was very much fundamentals and you know, I would ask people, oh, I'm just really not good with money. I'm like, cool, how many books about money do you read? Oh, none. I would, I'd try to read a money book once and I didn't resonate. Of course yeah. you don't fucking resonate. You're not good at that yet. Like yeah. you'll resonate when you read 20 of them and you start to get it, you know? So like the first thing is start to educate yourself on that dimension of life. You know, it's like... um People who are in that world would read lots of books about relationships probably and, you know, know lots about the dynamic. You know, they tell you their attachment style, their human design, their this, their that, their whatever. And it's like, cool. Just go and start at the Go and read fucking Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I've just Googled the, top, the best 10 money books and read three of them, you know? Just like basics, right? Like just learn some basics. Basics. Yeah. Basic yeah. literacy, you know? Like yeah. It's, that's where it's, and then yes, as you do that, you're going to be confronted by, oh, this makes me feel weird. Oh, I get tired when I read those kind of books. Oh, I feel funny about myself. It's like, yeah, because it's like doing a body journey and you take your shirt off and have a look at yourself for the first time in 20 years and go, fuck, I don't really like my body. And that's really hard to do, right? And that, and then the journey can begin of like, you know, I could be stronger, I could move better, I could open up my mobility, I could whatever. But the first moment of you know what like i've been sitting on couches watching tv for 10 years i am i you know overweight out of shape i have bad posture i'm this and that that has to be met in order to go on a journey of you know like should i take up running should i do breath work should i lift weights what you know like the first bit is just getting honest and i think that part if we if we have not attended to an area of life and we're realizing we're we're two out of ten in that area it's never fun to do that yeah. stock take. It's painful, you know? it's painful to say, hey, I'm crap. It's painful. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you sort of teach the basic that's marketing me. models, you bring in the magic stuff. Like, what's your approach kind of after coming in? Basically, I basically did a three pillars, sorry, four pillars around it. One is like money mindset, which is learning the rules, the basic principles of money. Two is learning how to make money. Three is learning how to keep money. And four is learning how to multiply money. So basically, we're talking education and mindset. Then we're talking pretty much sales and marketing, but also just getting into the idea that service and particularly intelligent service produces the result of money. Like if you are contributing something to the world, you start getting something back. That's just how it goes. You know, if there's an exchange happening, that's a fact. So, so basically, yes, sales and marketing, but also just getting into the idea that I want to contribute to other humans and I am prepared to receive back in return for that. Then there's management pieces around like, okay, so now you can make money, but what can you read? Can you do a budget? Can you read a financial statement? Can you um, track the in the inflows and outflows of your life month to month? And can you adjust those in order to have a surplus? And then, what I consider slightly more advanced is moving into, well, how do we multiply what we've got? How do we learn about investing? How do we build um, tiers of wealth? You know, I've got X amount of cash, then I bought gold, then I bought shares, then I got into crypto. Now I'm starting to acquire real estate. And it's like learning to understand the fundamentals of how to make money work for you and magnify it. So I look at those kind of four pillars as that's the basics. And and those that's all you ever need, you know, and, and even getting like, back to the jujitsu metaphor if you were a blue belt in all four of those you're better than probably 90 percent of people you know yeah yeah i kind of people started coming to me and asking me for advice on marketing when i was thinking god i'm not even sure if i'm a blue belt i'm really like orange belt or whatever you know i mean it depends on the system but yeah yeah way before that yeah uh, so nothing for me the marketing and sales stuff i do reasonably well and it's the, the managing it i've sometimes struggled with you know particularly as i scaled up my business a couple of years ago 
And um, after yeah. the conference, and we had this big thing, and it was like all of a sudden I was dealing with a different level of problem, you know, a different level of management. And I really wasn't equipped for that. I made a lot of mistakes with that. The same with, okay, I had money to invest for the first time and, you know, not quite knowing yeah. how that works and how to deal with that. That was like a whole new area for me at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I, re- I resonate to that. Like I'm I'm more in the developing in leadership and systems territory so I can scale things. You know, it's not about just getting better at marketing. It's about how to empower other people to do those things for me, how to systemize those things, how to not be so involved in the doing. And it's like, it's taken me a long time to even unpack what are the correct skills to acquire to level this up, you know, because it's not just turn that dial harder. It's actually a different way of looking at things. And that's, I, you know, I think this is a kind of a forever journey, but the stage I'm moving through is definitely a lot more about leadership, system scaling automation at least that's my business journey that i'm on at the moment we must be doing all right you're just done a, a bit of a world tour isn't it you've just been in the states now you're in berlin is it sort of <laughs> post-covid lockdown get out of I've, I've, one of my employees has just returned to australia i spoke to a couple of hours ago so it seems like what is this kind of like world tour just to get out there again i mean I only was in there because of the world events, you know, like the the plan was to, I had been touring a lot through sort of 2017, 2018, 2019. The plan was let's get a house, let's set up a base. And then my plan was, okay, once that's done and I've had a sort of six months ish of chill, I'm going to start setting up bases around the rest of the world. And then that opportunity got closed off for quite a while. So, you know, I had three years of, enforced but perfect grounding landing staying still you know going more inwards working on slower things now what i'm looking at is really re-establishing more of a global network and i you know i want to have an apartment in berlin i want to have a place in bali i want to have a place here and that's i want to live a global life but i want to live a very comfortable and free global life so that's I'm kind of just touring around, tuning into where do I like different communities, which which places give me what, you know? There's this there's this palette of when I'm in the States, everything expands. My entrepreneur is fucking on fire. The people, the, the entrepreneurial connections I have there are better than anywhere else in the world. When I'm in Berlin, it's more like art and sex, you know? Like your comments yeah. around like it's this poor, poor shithole or whatever. I'm like, ah, oh, it's cool because I'm not here for... I'm not going to make money. money you know? has got a Berlin's got a huge money shadow for sure. But as you say, if you want to yeah. go grimy and get into some interesting scenes, there's plenty of those in Berlin. Yeah, it's basically I realize this is where I get into my like writer, okay, Bukowski, William Burroughs, kind of Hunter Thompson, fucking all my favorite, like something around that comes through where it's like I can just sit in a bar and write, and it's very inspiring and it's cheap and it's cool. And that's what switches on for me here, you know. Yeah, just be careful you don't become a heroin addict and, uh, you know, have a gender change where you're <laughs> so, I think we're good on those, you know. I think good we're good those. for those. I, I guess, what's the state of the world now then? Like, you've probably done more traveling than me lately. Like, well, that's a big question, but where are we at? Yeah. Where are we at? <laughs> I mean, it might sound naive, but I think we're sweet, you know? Maybe it's just how I look at things. Like... You know, I see a lot of what's been really good for me in traveling has been getting references with my eyes and with conversations with people rather than social media, you know, and I feel like social media and the news has been forever portraying it's the end end times, right? It's the fucking end of the world. And I know a lot of people think like that, but hasn't it kind of always been the end of like wasn't it you know you're in 1100 it's like this comet's coming and we're all done and then it's yeah, like 1180 when when has that not been the human narrative like when i grew i grew up in the 80s and it was like the fucking cold war and shit nuclear weapons and it's like we don't even talk about that anymore. Nobody gives a fuck about nuclear weapons. Presumably, they're all still there. Well, we're right? they're talking about it a bit now. That's uh, certainly in my house. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. We're a bit closer I, I, to I, it. I don't know. I think the world is as perfect and fucked up as it ever was. And I think that is very magical thinking of me, but I think you largely get 
the channel that you tune into, you know? And so far, mine is good. <laughs> okay, well, that's nice to hear because I hear a lot of doom and gloom elsewhere and see a lot of darkness yeah. and uh, chaos and uh, lack of abundance. So, um, yeah, it's nice to hear that. I, I think, I guess it comes back to this thing we're talking about of like, what do people think the point of being here is, you know? And are they aware that they're all going to die and they were always going to die? That was in the contract from day one. So given given that we know that and we have that, what's the best case scenario that you're looking for? You know, is it a smooth run or is it, you know, no one's getting out alive, right? Like this is, people are aware of this part. So within the context of that, what are we trying to do here? And for me, it's have a rich experience, express myself fully. Yes, prosperity and wealth are for me part of that. And I try to not let them be, they're not the point, but they're kind of a, sort of sit in my top three values somehow because I feel like that that fuels and funds and makes everything else possible. But, and having good connections with other human beings and having the sense of having had an impact in the world, that's what I'm after. And I feel like, with the exception of just total fucking annihilation or being locked in a, you know, concentration camp or something, I'm probably going to have that, you know, I, I'm pretty committed to that's what's going to happen. And so I kind of feel like I'm having a good time. Okay. Well, so moving towards wrap up here. <laughs> so anything we have, do we, should we talk about sex some more? So I was like, other than strippers, we don't really talk about that. We haven't talked about conscious or any of that for sure. It's all, always always a good subject. So, what, why is that part of your life? Why is that part of your thing? I mean, it's it feels such a fundamental enlivening thing and part of the human experience, you know. And I think, you know, some people are like, you know, I'm very sexual. I don't know if I'm very sexual or not very sexual, but I've like most people, I've had a relationship to sexuality my whole life. Um, I think that with the deconditioning journey, like the deconditioning journey around money, the deconditioning journey around sexuality has freed up a lot of energy and freedom and creativity and power in my life. And so I see it. I, well, I guess I see it as one of the big two or three things that is worth working on and working with. Like if wealth is one of them, you know, sexuality is one of them for me. Creativity is one of them. Health is one of them. And those things unlock everything else, you know? And so I think I like being around people that are free-flowing in their life force. And whether that means that they're, that they're super sexual or not is not as important, but it, it does. I do notice the people that have unlocked their sexuality and worked through a lot of the shame and restriction that most people have they seem to be more free and moving through the world in a way that I find more enjoyable and more inspiring. So that I think it's a big part of yeah. making life interesting and good. Mm. Mm. Do you think we're a bit obsessed with sex again in the kind of counterculture world? It's the, the Soviets had this opinion. They first thought the hippies might be kind of good allies to, you know, sort of turn against capitalism. And then they're, they're sort of, the Soviet sort of KGB concluded they're all a bit sex obsessed, so they weren't going to be good allies for the communists. You know, I heard that the other day, and it kind of sort of made me smile somehow. And I think I was personally in that place for a while, and not so much now. Like, yeah, I mean, I I think that's just a natural stage of development, you know, like especially when things have been so repressed, and you see it. So this is where it's interesting. Like, you know, I've come through this sort of ritualistic thread and have a bit of a network of people who are have come through tantra and now are more on the kind of mystery school ritual magic sort of thing and why i've watched this journey of people that people that start open relating start doing tantra workshops start having kind of sexy play parties and stuff and some people that's where they get to and they just live there mm. and then there's another cohort of my friends that yeah they're in mostly polyamorous or open relating relationships and it's not about ha just having lots of sex. It becomes more about living a purpose-driven life or living from their soul. They might all language it differently. But, you know, there's a stage after, like, you mean we can just get an arm and do whatever we want, you know, which I still like knowing that. But it's not, it's not the whole point. And I think that um, 
you know, the hippie thing is kind of a bunch of people who got stuck at sort of sacral chakra. You know, we're looking at it as an evolutionary thing. It's like, cool, we've unlocked this. Let's just have parties and yay. And it's like, that's cool. And what are you going to do with that? So I think, you know, yeah, if you're looking at, if I was trying to build a, a motivated force of people to get something done, I wouldn't just recruit sexy hippies, you know? I would I would try to find, this is literally almost unpacks my kind of world. It's like I'm actually filtering for the sexy hippies that actually have purpose. Right. This this seems like it's about evolutionary or kind of journey here. Like, you know, a lot of listeners are fairly mature in their practice. They've done things for a while. You know, we've had this kind of stuff in the West forever, but certainly since the 60s. So that's a whole generation or two, you know. And most people like me have been through a few years of stuff. And it's like you throw out competition and then you start doing jujitsu. You throw out sexual conservatism, go super liberal, and then maybe you bring a bit more conservatism back in. You throw out money, then you bring money back in. Like there seems that's yeah. like, I don't know if you want to speak more to the kind of evolutionary or the kind of stages people might pass through on these journeys. Because I, again, I'll meet someone who's 25 and just got into yoga and just rejected Western values for the first time. It's sort of cute. Yeah. You know? It's like, oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. India, you know? I'm like, good luck with that, you know? Yeah. So what do you say yeah. about that sort of evolutionary journeys? We've kind of alluded to it all the way through the call, really. Yeah, I, I love this. This subject is really dear to my heart, I think, and it's things like integral and particularly spiral dynamics for me have been really big influences in looking at things through a bit more of a meta and a bit more of a developmental lens. And one of the things that I find fascinating about the, the spiral in spiral dynamics is this alternating of values as you climb up that um, consciousness stack, you know? So first it's survival, which is the individual, but then it's tribal, which is the group. But then it's my goals and my ego and what I want, which is the individual. And then it's like, yes, but a greater collective of a society with rules and whatever, which is the group. And then it's the kind of capitalist innovator, which is the individual. But then it's more like conscious community, which is the group, you know? And it's like Western society right now is juggling and dancing between those sort of levels a lot and struggling to break through to that integral level, which for me is where the magic starts, which is, and this happens to me all the time where like maybe I express one view on how I think about business and money and it's like, oh, so this guy's kind of more right-leaning. And then I might have a different view mm -hmm. on feminism or equality on a specific subject, which makes me sound more left-leaning. But then on a different issue around identity politics, I'm like, that's this bit is all bullshit. And they're like, but I thought you were with us on this. And it's like, oh, I am with you on that. But on this, I just feel <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't invest in that. And it so that's confusing. People. You're not really. Uh, well, but yeah. which, uh, and, it's, and what we've got kind of the you know, younger generation growing up, I, saw, I see some of this being integrated. Like, you know, I see more entrepreneurial young people than I remember. I coached yep. um, a student, 16-year-old the other day, and he had his shit together, man. He's like watching stuff on entrepreneurship and investing and, you know, like body stuff, like weightlifting, super scientific approach to that, you know, listens to Huberman. And then you've also got, you know, young people that are dead into kink at quite a young age. Like, don't mm -hmm. remember at 20 being so groovy, you know, at university sort of exploring sex, not exactly, not the first time, but kind of just getting into it. I don't remember it being like, hey, let's go to a, a Japanese rope work workshop. You know, no. like it seems to be like you can get into that kind of stuff quite young now for better and for worse. So there's sort of all these trends, plus there's the kind of woke thing. A lot of young women, yeah. you, you just think that men oppress women and that's how the world is. That's their worldview. And it's um, that's changed since I was young. I don't remember there being that the sort of green meme in Spiral Dynamics term kind of embedded in culture. Like so, so I'm not just like trying that, to get my head around what's changed here. I, I think I watched this. What's that movie? Everything, everywhere, all at once. You know, I've had it recommended it's to me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Great, great, great film. And it's not about any of this, but just that title. I think sums it up. You know, of like, like I can scroll TikTok and I will see the most extreme woke, whatever. And then I can watch a video of some dude punching some other guy in the back of the head and a button. It's like, oh, it's it's all here, you know. And it's the same. And it's like the same. I'm like, you guys are the same generation, so I can't put you into like all of Gen Z are this. It's like some of you guys are fucking rough, you know, and some of you guys are really concerned about 
this piece of language and this piece of thing. And I just think, well, I, I have one business mentor who has mentored and worked with a lot of high level millionaires and, and a handful of billionaires. And so he has access to a world that's a little bit above the world that I've played in. And one of the things he was telling me that I found fascinating is the billionaires that he has met and befriended that are all a little bit kind of aspy in their ways. The one common thread is like they don't argue with anything about the emerging generation. They just take it as feedback of, oh, that's what's coming in. So um, whereas a normal 40-year-old or 50-year-old uh, would be like, ah, yeah, oh, yeah. this thing, I can't fucking get it. Right, right. That's a, a very natural human reflex of the next generation you're going to disagree with. He's like, they don't do that. They just look at it as like, ah, oh, this is where humanity is going to be in X amount of time. That's just, it's just more like a pure data thing. And when I heard that, it really softened me up around um, the difficulties I was having with kind of Gen Gen Z kind of stuff. Because I'm like, this is fucking weird for me, you know? And it would make me feel like, oh, I'm, I'm, am I conservative? Like, how am I, you know, I didn't think I was that. And now I'm just like, oh, okay. I've just let little bits of it wash over me. Don't worry about it if I agree or not. I'm just kind of take it as like data, I guess, which has been really helpful to me. Yeah, I used to get pretty triggered by it and pretty like, rah, rah, they're crazy woke kids. And now it's just, it just seems like a waste of energy somehow, you know? Just, just, just it, don't if you it. were in that, you would be more like that. You know, it's just this fucking like. <laughs> yeah, it's not a grown up. All right, uh, we need to wrap up. So, Dane, where, where do people find your stuff, actually? I was just Googling here and like, what's the best place to, to check you out? Easiest entry point is Instagram. It's at dane.thomas. Thomas is T O M A S. That's where share a bunch of videos on reels and promote courses and also share pieces of writing. And that, that kind of leads to everything else. So anything interesting I'm doing, which changes kind of month to month, quarter to quarter, um, we share it all through there. Cheers, man. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. I knew it'd be interesting. I thought I could probably go for another couple of hours. So, um, yeah, you're welcome back anytime, mate. Love it. Great, great little roller coaster. Thanks for having me. If you like that, you probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here, um, some exclusive ones with some big names, some people you'll probably recognize that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF, my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to have people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga, and you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.